Hi there, welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this research showcase in allergy and asthma at Imperial. Uh, my name is Dr. Marta vatkiv Ortiz and I'm a consultant in paediatric allergy and I'm the director of the Allergy Postgraduate Programme at Imperial. And it's a great pleasure to be here today to hear some perspectives from uh, our colleagues, um, academics on food immunotherapy and, and asthma. Next slide. It's great to see quite a few people already who have joined and, and happy to hear a bit about uh, a bit of a snapshot of what's going on at Imperial in terms of allergy and asthma research and also, uh, as I said, perspectives and, and kind of opinions about um, hot topics in this specialty. Um, Imperial academics and clinicians have done great contributions to the development of allergy as a scientific and clinical discipline. And it was at St Mary's Hospital, where we're still based, where Noon and Freeman developed and published about allergen specific immunotherapy for the first time. And that was in The Lancet in 1911, so very much over 100 years ago. And I would like to mention as well two truly outstanding uh, figures in allergy who sadly left us not a long time ago. And one is, of course, Dr. Bill Franklin, who ran one of the uh, first dedicated allergy services in the country and, and partly in the world as well, also at St. Mary's, and who also did the first clinical trial in allergen specific immunotherapy in the 50s. And then Professor Barry Kay, whose work on T2 immunology and uh, eosinophilic inflammation has really helped us understand the pathophysiology of asthma. And this has, of course, opened opportunities for mechanisms uh, based treatments such as biologics that are a very, um, a very uh, interesting um, area of development in the last years. And this long-standing tradition of excellence in research, in clinical practice and in education has continued over the years, and it has led to the great array of academics and clinical academics we have as Imperial in a range of aspects, and you probably will recognize quite a few faces in there. So in areas like asthma, immunotherapy, food allergy, anaphylaxis, as well as the early origins of the disease. And I feel really privileged to work closely with them as their module leads in our allergy MSc that I that I lead. And I learn lots from them and we generally have lots of fun and lots of good discussions. And we just wanted to bring a bit of that today. Um, next one, next slide. And we have a really nice program with uh, Professor Sechon Saglani talking about recent advances in asthma diagnosis and management. And then Dr. Paul Tana talking about food immunotherapy, where do we stand? So a very, very hot topic as well. So um, I'm just going to introduce Professor Saglani and many of you will, will know Sigel well as a professor of paediatric respiratory medicine at Imperial, honorary consultant in paediatric respiratory medicine at the Royal Brompton, and she leads the section of inflammation repair and development at NHLI, where all of us, the allergy family at, at Imperial seat. Um, thanks so much, Sigel, uh, for joining today and over to you. Great, thanks very much, Marta. Thank you all for joining in the evening on a lovely sunny evening. I hope I can excite you all a bit about asthma and encourage you to join us um, at Imperial for our allergy course. So yeah, we're gonna talk about advances uh, in diagnosis and management. The focus will be childhood asthma as I am a respiratory pediatrician, but there will be a lot of parallels that we'll draw that are very, very similar for adults and children. So if I can move on. OK, so why are we talking about asthma in children? Well, it's the most common non-communicable disease that affects children worldwide, not just in the UK, not just in Europe globally. But in the UK, we've got over a million children affected by asthma. So in average, it's about three in every class. It's a common condition. And because of that, the NHS expenditure for asthma is huge, at least a billion pounds spent annually treating asthma in children. And the thing that I really want to focus on and make a deal about today is that it's not a benign condition. On average, about three people die of an asthma attack every day in the UK, both adults and children. And in the 21st century, when we have good treatments for asthma, that's kind of really unforgivable. And that's why I'm talking about the basics of getting the diagnosis correct and real simple things about adjusting management. And then if we focus in on children, this is a slide not to be proud of. The UK has the second highest asthma mortality rate for children in the world. 
per 100,000 population. These are figures from 2019. And deaths, as you can see, the blue line uh, is second highest in children aged 10 to 14. It's really unacceptable and we've got to get better at managing this disease. And I hope I can show you some ways that we're trying to achieve that. So what I'm going to talk about is some of the difficulties around making a diagnosis uh, of asthma and how we really do insist on doing tests to support the diagnosis. Now, we're not just relying on history and examination. And at the end, I just want to give you a sort of a snippet of some new approaches to management, which you would hear learn a lot more about if, if you join the course. So what happens in asthma? Well, in any adult or child with an underlying susceptibility to asthma, their otherwise healthy airway wall, when it's exposed to allergens, develops and undergoes changes of inflammation and structural airway changes that we term airway remodeling to end up in a thickened airway wall, which is what the remodeling results in, and marked eosinophilia. So the cells you can see here, the airways become inflamed with eosinophilia, and that's the basic of the majority of asthma in the majority of patients. Definitely the majority of children, but even the majority of adults, this is what happens. And then it manifests itself in terms of reversible airflow obstruction. So on the left here, we've got a flow volume loop of a patient that's done some spirometry. Um, the top half is the expiratory part and the black line shows a scoop line which shows uh, air, airflow obstruction. And the red dotted line is after some bronchodilator that that's reversed. And that's classical asthma. That's what we should be looking for. And the eosinophilia you can see uh, is in the airway wall and in the airway lumen. From This is a, an example of a biopsy from a patient with asthma jam-packed full of eosinophils. So how do we find this clinically and how do we convince ourselves that the patient in front of us has really got asthma? Well, definitely history and examination are critical and we've got to do that right and we've got to do that properly. And really, we've got to confirm the presence of wheezing when a patient is presenting to us acutely unwell. Doctor confirmed wheeze is really, really important because often people like me uh, only see patients in the clinic and they're completely well. But we really need objective evidence of true wheeze uh, when, the, when the patient is unwell. But the other way that we try and confirm asthma is use other objective tests to make us which are supportive of the diagnosis of asthma. The one thing we have to remember is that there's no gold standard test for asthma, like a sweat test for cystic fibrosis. That does not exist. So what we are now learning is we need information and evidence from different tests together with the history and examination to really confirm the diagnosis. And lung function is now critical to this, making the diagnosis showing airway obstruction with a reduced FEV1 FBC ratio, showing evidence of airflow reversibility, bronchodilator reversibility, and if spirometry is hard, then at least some evidence of variability on peak flow assessments. Why is it important to do this? Well, here's the spirometry of a patient with asthma. I've just shown you that. But what would you see, what would you think if you saw this type of flow volume loop in a person that's coming to you with a diagnosis of asthma? There's a stark difference between these two flow volume loops. The one on the right is not asthma. It's something very, very different. And this is what we see in patients who have an upper airway persistent obstruction. And this is the type of flow volume loop that we saw in this patient who at bronchoscopy in the trachea had this huge mass and for six months was being treated with bronchodilators and inhaled steroids as if they had asthma. This child was 14 and I hope you'll all agree did not have asthma. Similarly, this child did not have asthma, but they had a flow volume loop very similar to the one I've just shown you. They had inhaled a nose stud, which was stuck in their right main bronchus. Getting the diagnosis right is critical, and I really want to emphasize this with a case. So this is a 15-year-old boy that was referred to as a really keen footballer, was playing for his local team and was being scouted by Chelsea to be playing for them. He'd had some episodes of croup in early childhood. This is important and I'll come back to that, why that is later. And he presented initially at 11 years of age with breathlessness developing during training and matches. And a couple of times he almost collapsed because he was so breathless and struggling with his breathing. 
went to the doctor, GP, primary care, secondary care, you've got asthma, escalating treatment up and up and up with no benefit. But, and the episodes kept increasing in frequency and severity to the extent that this boy who was being scouted by Chelsea had to stop all exercise. He finally got referred in at three years later and when a more detailed history was taken, it became apparent that he was only developing symptoms during exercise. This is really critical. I know exercise induced asthma is a thing and absolutely agree with that. But the majority of cases of true exercise induced asthma symptoms occur at the end or after exercise, not at the onset or during exercise. He, when you asked him more carefully, was experiencing a tightness in his throat and it felt like he was breathing in through a straw. Asthma is not about inspiratory problems, it's about expiratory problems. And everything resolved on stopping exercise. That's not exercise induced asthma. Exercise induced asthma does not resolve when you stop exercise, you need treatment to make it better. And so we did some investigations and his spirometry, as you can see here, was plumb normal. His exhaled nitric oxide, which I'll come on to, a marker of airway inflammation, plumb normal. Flow volume loop, it's not scooped, plumb normal. And we realized actually this was nothing to do with asthma and there was something going on in his upper airway. And we thought this was exercise induced laryngeal obstruction and referred him to physiotherapy. And actually, when the physiotherapist assessed him on exertion, his breathing pattern was way off. He was doing lots of apical breathing and it, it definitely was not expiratory wheezing that you would get with asthma. So he was given some breathing exercises and when he was reviewed, he wasn't really any better. So he was assessed on the treadmill and his saturations dropped when his throat tightened. And his mum said, actually, yeah, his lips do go a bit blue when he exercises. So we thought, there's something not right, what's going on? And so this is one of the things we're able to do at a tertiary centre, the Brompton Hospital, continuous laryngeal um, exercise so that with an, a laryngoscope down, we ask the, the patient to exercise and we assess them. And this is a video of this child's um, continuous laryng uh, laryngeal um, exercise. And you can see at the bottom, we've got the epiglottis, we can see the vocal cords and we're asking him to exert himself more and more. Now, if you and I exert ourselves, our airways should open up. But I hope you saw here, I'll just play it one more time, that as he exerts himself more and more, and I'll stop it at the point that I want you to see this, instead of opening up, his airway and his vocal cords are actually completely closing off. And so they were doing exactly the opposite to what they should do instead of add up adapting they were coming completely together and he needed treatment for exercise induced laryngeal obstruction not asthma not inhaled steroids and it's completely wrong so we've got to get the diagnosis right how are we going to do this well we can't just rely on history and examination we need to do some tests and if we think to ourselves what tests can we do well the cardinal features of asthma are certainly wheezing dry cough, breathlessness and chest tightness, which we can get from the history. But there are tests we can do for allergic sensitization, airway eosinophilia and reversible airflow obstruction. And this is what all guidelines are now saying we should be doing to really make the diagnosis. These are the guidelines from the National Institute for Clinical Excellence saying in children and equally in adults, a diagnosis of asthma should only be made if they have symptoms and if they have obstructive spirometry with bronchodilatory visibility. And if you can't do that lung function, and if you can't demonstrate that, then they should have an elevated excel nitric oxide. And the cutoff for children who are steroid naive or not on treatment is 35 parts per billion. And if nothing else, then peak flow variability must be done. So what's excel nitric oxide? Well, it's a non-invasive biomarker reflecting airway eosinophilia or type 2 immunity and it's very very useful to understand whether the child has airway inflammation that is consistent with allergic asthma that's likely to respond to steroids. The only caveat and none of these tests are completely straightforward is that you can have a child in front of you who is atopic without asthma and may have an elevated excel nitric oxide so I just want to emphasize there's no gold standard test 
But all of these things together come together to make the diagnosis of asthma. And if you join us on our course, the one thing I think you'd all want to know is how am I supposed to do an exile nitric oxide if I haven't got the machine and if I don't know how to? We will teach you all these techniques. We'll teach you how to do spirometry and we'll teach you how to do exile nitric oxide and how to interpret the tests properly. The other tests that you definitely have a workshop on are skin prick tests. So we've got to look for allergen sensitization, supportive of asthma. And somehow we need to elicit eosinophilia in this child's airways or this patient's airways. And blood eosinophils are being used increasingly as a biomarker to represent airway eosinophils. And what we're using now and testing in our clinic it's a finger prick blood eosinophil count, so a child doesn't have to have a vene puncture, but just like children with diabetes, we're getting more and more used to doing finger prick tests to find their eosinophil count to help decide have they got asthma or haven't they, have they got eosinophilia or haven't they. An ideal to look at the airways is an induced sputum, which is a very specialised test, I accept that, and excel nitric oxide. But no one test exactly represents eosinophilia, no one test exactly represents asthma. You've got to put the whole picture together to really make the diagnosis. And when you've made the diagnosis, what's really critical that we often don't do very well is document why you think the patient in front of you has got asthma. What is it about the history and the examination? What is the lung function result? What is the inflammation result? Because once we start treatment, it gets really difficult to make the diagnosis. When you've made the diagnosis, certainly you should start treatment. And this is the first thing I want to emphasize in terms of management. We no longer just prescribe as required bronchodilators for children with asthma. We always start with low dose inhaled corticosteroids. Anti-inflammatory treatment is critical to the success of treating patients with asthma and it's critical to preventing asthma deaths. But look at this graph. This is the impact of inhaled corticosteroids, as you can see, from 1960 when we didn't have them to 19 kind of late 1980s onwards. The thing that's worrying, though, is asthma mortality remains. If you look from 1990 onwards, yes, there's a plateau, but we still have asthma deaths. And this is five to 34 year olds in 46 countries. And if we zoom in, you can see we've kind of plateaued. Why have we still got asthma deaths, even though we've got an effective treatment in the form of inhaled steroids? Well, because we don't get the basics of management right. Are we actually showing our patients how they should be taking their treatment? Are we showing them how to take it properly? No child should ever be taking a metered dose inhaler without a spacer. And they should know when they need a mask and when they should have a mouthpiece. And the real critical thing to ensuring that we stop asthma deaths is making sure children take their treatment. And adherence to inhaled steroids is a real challenge because we're asking them to take a treatment when they're feeling well and they don't feel any immediate benefit from it. So why should they take their treatment? If there's one thing they're gonna forget, it's I forget my inhaler, I feel fine, my asthma's fine. The other thing we don't do, and we don't help ourselves or our patients, is we don't give them a simple regime. We give them loads of different inhalers and devices, and they're confused and they don't know what to do. And so what happens is in the autumn, we have year on year a peak in attacks, and that's the highest risk of both hospitalizations, but also asthma deaths. Why? Because in the summer, the kids were well, they stopped taking their treatment and suddenly they're presenting with acute attacks. Why? Well, because an acute attack is caused by allergen exposure, smoke exposure. Most of them are sensitized to animals and they're being exposed to them. There's pollution. And then the final thing in, this, in September is a little cold and they end up with an attack. And this is what happens in their airways. Their airways are chopped full of eosinophils because they didn't take their anti-inflammatory treatment, which was the inhaled steroid, and they have a severe asthma attack and several of them may die. How can we stop that? Well, this is what I wanted to say is what we're really emphasizing now is no child should ever be taking just a short acting bronchodilator, just salbutamol. Every time a child picks up their salbutamol in parallel, they should be picking up an inhaled steroid. So they've got anti-inflammatory therapy on board all the time, anti-inflammatory reliever 
in parallel. And the best way of achieving this is the smart regime, a single inhaler for maintenance and reliever therapy with budesonide, which is the steroid, and formoterol, which is a long-acting beta agonist that has an immediate effect and a long-acting effect. And the data for this is good for children over 12, even those with mild asthma, if they're randomized to either have maintenance inhaled steroids with their bronchodilator, whenever they pick up their bronchodilator, they have an inhaled steroid, or they go to as required budesonide for motrol or as required short acting bronchodilator. The one thing that's really obvious from this graph is the blue line, which is the as required short acting bronchodilator had the largest number of acute attacks. Whereas the children who were given as required Symbicort combined device, or as long as they took their inhaled steroid every time they used their short acting bronchodilator, the number of attacks is significantly reduced. So we have to move to this. And Gina are now saying that there's no such thing as as required bronchodilator. Everybody, the moment they need their bronchodilator, must have an inhaled steroid on board, whether that's a combined preparation or the two inhalers separately. Definitely for adults and adolescents. We have less data for younger children, but step one you can still see is always take your inhaled steroid when you're taking your bronchodilator. So that's just a kind of real rapid <laughs> run through of the types of things that we will be discussing if you join the course and a bit of an update for you on the importance of getting the diagnosis right and the changes we're making to management of asthma even when we think it's mild, it can still cause asthma attacks and we've got to really do our best to make that a never event. Thanks very much. Thanks so, so much, Sejan, for this very practical talk with lots of um, useful tips um, for practice. So thanks a lot. So um, our attendees can put questions in the chat in the Q&A function and we have a couple of them there so that they're quite related and it's, I think it's a very nice topic. So it's, What's the impact of lifestyles, the psychosocial issues, environmental issues on asthma, and particularly on asthma severity? And, and I know you have lots of experience in addressing and assessing that, and you might want to talk about the stepwise approach, MDT approach of, of the Bromptons. Yeah, so the one thing I didn't talk about today was children with difficult asthma, difficult to control asthma and problematic asthma. That's definitely the bulk of patients that we see. And that definitely requires a multidisciplinary team approach because in the majority of those patients, usually the, it's the basics of asthma management that's making their asthma difficult to control. First of all, that they're probably not taking their treatment, but as has been suggested, there's a huge impact, for example, from smoke exposure. Tobacco smoke exposure is a huge deal and we do our absolute best to make that minimize that or not allow that. And then allergen exposure to allergens that the children are sensitized to. So I put the picture of the cat and dog up there. But the, a lot of our patients are sensitized to pets, yet they still have pets at home. And the point is that even if if they're sensitized, they can feel well, but if they've got a constant allergen background exposure, it just takes a small thing like a cold to, to precipitate the attack. So there is a significant component of uh, allergen exposure of things that they're sensitized to, smoke exposure, and then certainly pollution. There's not much we can do about the pollution, but what we can do is make sure they're taking their basic anti-inflammatory treatment so that their airways can cope when they get a, something like a cold on top and they don't have such a severe episode or attack. That's great, Sejal. Uh, would you like to comment on more psychosocial factors? So um, families with, with um, difficult backgrounds, say um, poverty, so less privileged families, Celtic families, etc. So what we know is social disadvantage is most definitely associated with, with poor asthma control. Um, the difficulty there and, and then of course if they're living in an environment where there's perhaps mold in the house, damp in the house, all of these things can contribute to poor asthma control and our sort of multidisciplinary team includes a social worker, it includes uh, people with expertise in safeguarding children, so all of these things absolutely contribute but I think the only thing I, the thing I want to emphasize is we Somehow it's sometimes it's difficult to overcome those type of psychosocial factors. But the one thing we can all get right is the basics of the management of the treatment to make sure that at least 
the children are getting the treatment on board to minimise the impact of any additional factors that can make their asthma control poor. Great, Sergio, very helpful. Uh, there's a question from a patient's perspective. Someone is saying, I've always taken Ceratide. What's the benefit of uh, switching to Simbicort? Uh, because I've given the option and you might want to comment on MAC therapy. Yeah, so the, the difference between Ceratide and Simbicort is Ceratide contains the inhaled steroid and a long acting version of your probably Ventolin or your reliever inhaler. But in the serotide, that long acting version of your Ventolin doesn't give you immediate benefit. So you just have to take serotide regularly twice a day and then you have to resort to your reliever inhaler for when you feel wheezy. The advantage of the Symbicort, if it suits you, is that it, the, the um, reliever part of it, not the steroid part, but the reliever part of it has both a long acting effect and an immediate effect. So if in, what we're trying to do is minimise the complication of people's asthma regimes. So if you went to a Symbicort um, and you felt that immediate benefit, you could get away with just one inhaler. So you would be taking your, that inhaler twice a day regularly and whenever you feel wheezy, you take that same inhaler. So it's minimising the complexity of the regime. It's a single inhaler and a single device all the time, whether you're symptomatic or taking it regularly. So it's worth a try if it suits you. Great, Sitch. And there's a couple of questions. One is about smart as well, so links nicely. So uh, someone is um, asking, you know, when you have a patient on MARC regime, will you give an MDI with a spacer for the event of an asthma attack where they might not have the sort of the, the ability to take the, the, the deep breath in? That's a really important point. So in the UK, uh, for children, we're only able to prescribe a turbo and uh, That's a dry powdered device. And as you've said, uh, you need a good breath in to be able to take that effectively. And if a child is having an attack, the ability uh, of them to be able to take that dry powdered inhaler may be reduced. And we would always give uh, families uh, an MDI with a spacer to have at home while they're waiting to either go into the emergency department or if um, they're worried that they're not able to take the uh, turbo inhaler well enough. I must admit, if they're at that stage, they should be heading towards an emergency department or to the GP anyway. So it's just a backup plan. It's not that you stay at home and you carry on with the, the MDI and space or with Ventolin. Great, thanks. So we have a few more questions and so we might take a couple of them and then we will move on to Paul and, and say, Jelly, if you want to type a few more answers there, we can sure. we can facilitate that. So one of the questions is what about the uh, scenario of having a patient with no symptoms or infrequent symptoms where you have a normal spirometry with normal parameters, normal flow loop and then evidence of reversibility? How do you yeah. interpret this? So if you've got evidence of reversibility, uh, that's as far as I'm concerned, good enough for asthma, as long as they've got the symptoms that are consistent, true wheezing, they've been seen during an acute episode and the history fits. Evidence of reversibility is key. So if you've got that or peak flow variability, that would definitely fit with the diagnosis uh, for me uh, and that would warrant uh, treatment. Yeah. A very short question also related to this. Do you recommend reversing all children with respective of normal baseline flow loop? Yeah, so that's that's an interesting question. Um, I would I wouldn't uh, do bronchodilator reversibility if there's no evidence of obstruction on the baseline loop. However, even if your baseline loop shows an FEV1 of 90 percent, but you've got the FVC of 120 percent, so you've got evidence of obstruction, I would do bronchodilator reversibility because you've got to remember that for children, percent predicted doesn't mean as much. And actually, if they've got the capacity, a lot of children will have um, uh, lung function above 100 percent predicted, especially depending on their ethnicity, uh, on their background, the reference ranges can change. So if you've got evidence of obstruction of um, FEV1, FVC 0.8 is the cutoff that we use. Um, then I would definitely look for reversibility. Yeah, that's great. And very last question. I think the answer is short. Um, does this need for adherence and maintenance of all these treatments in asthma still apply after the child becomes an adult? Or are they less? Oh God, yeah, absolutely. So the the mortality data I showed you was across the board, and 
as adults do unfortunately die of asthma. And this um, approach is now absolutely recommended for adults that you have to have a combined preparation uh, for any adult with asthma. There's no such thing as just uh, short acting bronchodilator. It really is anti-inflammatory and reliever therapy together. Really, really important, yeah. Thanks so, so much, Sejal. I think there are a couple of questions there, so we might put that in the chat for you to type. Thanks so, so much, really helpful and, and very interesting to hear all this. Um, great, so we're gonna move on to Paul. I see Paul's uh, on camera already. So uh, Dr. Paul Sarna is a consultant reader in pediatric allergy and clinical immunology at Imperial. Um, he has a number of roles in uh, Public Health England, the Food Standards Agency and MHRA, and he's the director of the Clinical uh, Research Facility for Children at Imperial. Um, you might know Paul very well, uh, lots of research on food allergy, anaphylaxis and food immunotherapy, and he's going to be talking about food immunotherapy, where do we stand, which is a hot topic, particularly in the light of Paul Forcia coming into this country. So um, over to you, Paul. Great, thanks Marta, and it's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you everyone for dialing in, or what a teaming in, if that's what you're meant to say. Um, and so I've been asked to um, give a brief update on food immunotherapy and where we at both in the UK, but also globally. And so over the next sort of 20 minutes, we're gonna talk about a little bit of the history, where things stand and where things might go in the future. And I think it's really important, this is my perspective that I'm giving you here. Um, I am conflicted in some ways um, in that I have done consulting and advisory board work with both AMU and DBV, although DBV is more historic. Um, and um, they are two of the key players at the moment in food immunotherapy. Having said that, I don't think there's anything I'm saying in this slide that um, is going to be an issue in terms of that conflict of interest. So I guess the first question that we need to think about is, well, actually, what's the point? Why, are we, why bother with oral immunotherapy? And our starting point has to be this data, which one of our, many of our colleagues led by Robert Boyle, who again is a very involved in the master's course, um, led on almost 10 years ago now um, with Sunta, um, again, a member of our clinical and research team. And what they did was look in the literature for how common it is for bad things to happen to you if you have food allergy compared to bad things if you don't have food allergy. And so typically in any one year, around one in 10 people age not to 18 years will hurt themselves and have to go to accident and emergency because of their injury. And around one in 300 or so will have to go to emergency because of a accident regarding a motor vehicle or as a pedestrian. And then around one in 10,000 might die and so on. And dying due to lightning, there's always the lightning strike on these sorts of figures, um, one in 10 million. You'll note that the likelihood of dying due to murder is significantly greater in the USA rather than Europe and I'll let you ponder whether that has anything to do um, with the rights to bear arms or not. But let's not get too political here. What about if you have food allergy? Well around one in ten people in any year will say well I had a reaction, an accidental reaction and I had anaphylaxis. Someone like me agreeing with them probably about 10% of those, so medically coded anaphylaxis. Being admitted to hospital, which perhaps is a surrogate marker for more severe reactions, because we know that people who tend to get admitted to hospital, at least outside the UK setting, tend to be those with more severe symptoms at presentation, again, about 10% of this group. And dying from food anaphylaxis, about one in a quarter of a million. And so this is our problem, that there's a perception that severe outcomes and death from food anaphylaxis is very high, scarily high. But actually, we only have about one fatality a month. Now, that's one fatality too much. The last thing I'm trying to do is to sort of minimise and talk people out of a case in, the, you know, taking food allergy seriously. 
But the vast majority of people seem to be able to sort themselves out if they have a reaction. Their body is designed to compensate. Just like if you cut yourself, you don't need to go to a hospital to have stitches. You just put a bit of pressure on it and you clot. That likewise happens for most people having anaphylaxis. The problem is that it doesn't always happen and we can't predict those people where it doesn't happen and they're the ones who end up in trouble. And so essentially there's a little bit of a game of Russian roulette going on here. You know, people think they'll be OK and they're not OK or people think they won't be OK, but actually they are OK. But very, very rarely someone isn't OK and they make the headlines of the newspapers. But one of the things that we need to do is think about, well, how can we make that better? And the problem with oral immunotherapy is that because so few people die from food anaphylaxis, it's very unlikely to impact on deaths. However, there's plenty more to food allergy. Accidental reactions are common. One in eight kids with peanut allergy has at least one accidental reaction every year, according to some data sets. And for milk, it might actually be even more common. And so we know that just telling someone avoid the thing you're allergic to doesn't work. And we know that because of the concerns of thinking I've always got to avoid the thing I'm eating in and, you know, is it hidden? What does it mean? May contain peanut. Does that mean I can eat it or can't eat it? And the concern that people perhaps might have a reaction has a huge impact on this dynamic here. And this impacts significantly on people's quality of life and their ability to cope and live as normal. Our patients want to be like their peers. They don't want to be different. They don't want to be not allowed to do stuff. They don't want to be worried if they're going on holiday, how are they going to communicate? What happens if they have a reaction? Where are the hospitals? How they speak the language and so on. They want to be like the rest of us. And so one of the key questions we have to ask is not, is it going to stop people dying? But actually, well, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to improve quality of life? Are we trying to cure food allergy? Or actually, are we just trying to reduce risk? Because one of the things that is increasingly obvious is that yes, we might want people to be freely able to eat the food they're allergic to ad libitum. But actually, most of our patients don't like the taste of the thing they're allergic to. That's a biological safety mechanism. Don't like peanut, I'm not going to eat it. And we see that commonly in the children we've desensitized to peanut. Or for something like cow's milk, they can have a certain amount, but if they go above that, they have reactions. And so increasingly, these middle two options are probably not going to happen. How does it work? Well, it's quite simple. Actually, um, this graph here is what we call a dose distribution curve. And essentially what we've done is plot hundreds of people on this curve with peanut allergy. And then we've drawn a line through them. And so up here is a dose that 100% of people with peanut allergy would react to. Here, this dose here is the dose that about 35% of people with peanut allergy will react to with objective symptoms. And that's actually about half for peanuts. So it gives you a bit of an idea about the sorts of amounts that people with peanut allergy are allergic to. This group here, about 10% of people will react to about a 15th of a peanut. And actually, this group here is about 80%. So 20% of people are actually able to eat uh, around four to 10 peanuts without too much problem. They'll get an itchy mouth or something, but they might not have objective symptoms or anaphylaxis. And then when we do desensitization, this is what happens. We shift this curve over. So if you started off here, you end up over here instead. And between a 10 to 100 fold increase in the dose of peanut, you can eat before something starts to happen. Now, a number of studies have been carried out, what we call systematic reviews and meta-analyses to look at efficacy, to look at safety of food allergy. And the two most recent are one done by a group called the Gallon Group. This is a group that's written um, food allergy and anaphylaxis guidelines for Europe. And then the other is a review from a systematic review um, from a Canadian team that specializes in this sort of work. And looking at the gallon results first, what we have is the effect of desensitization. So desensitization is effective in 
basically 50% of patients. So this is what we need. The number needed to treat is two. So for every two patients we desensitize to cow's milk or to hen's egg or to peanut, we will succeed in one of them. It's actually nearer 60 to 70%, depending on what sort of protocol you use. However, a similar amount will develop adverse reactions, as you can see here. And in actual fact, one of the interesting things is that for Peanut, the Gallon group found that they weren't more likely to have adverse reactions compared to people on peanut avoidance. Now, actually, that needs qualifying because they looked at the number of patients treated who would have at least one reaction. So having at least one reaction, we know we're around 20 to 50 percent of kids avoiding peanut will have one reaction a year. Having reactions on OIT, around a similar amount will have at least one reaction, but actually the majority of them will have multiple low grade reactions with immunotherapy. So that doesn't quite reflect the real picture here, which is why the data is quite different from the PACE systematic review, that for every seven people treated with peanut immunotherapy, at least one will have anaphylaxis. And actually, um, for every 22 treated, um, one will need adrenaline um, to actually rescue them because um, other measures won't do the trick. And so there is this balance that we have to have between effect and efficacy and safety. And looking a bit more in depth at the PACE immunotherapy, it's quite interesting because quite clearly um, this is what we call a forest plot. And if you look where these are different studies and then the computer algorithm summarizes the average as such at meta-analysis and essentially the risk is definitely greater if you're on uh, if you're on immunotherapy in that the risk of anaphylaxis here is much lower not on OIT and similarly the risk of adverse events again much less likely to happen if you're not on OIT. Now that is to me bleedingly obvious if you're taking the food you're allergic to every single day of course, you're going to have reactions. However, those reactions are happening in a context of a treatment and therefore they're more expected rather than unexpected. Let's dig down a little bit more. These are the main two studies published by AIMUNE um, that have looked at PAL4 as the new treatment that we have in the UK for peanut allergy. And actually, you can see that these are percentages. And yes, in the placebo group, lots of placebo reactions were happening. People who didn't know they were on placebo reporting reactions, but the majority of those were mild. If you then drill down into sort of more severe reactions, well, actually, anaphylaxis reactions are quite common on parforsia. They were quite rare on placebo. The ones that did happen are generally due to accidental reactions in restaurants or something like that. But nonetheless, there is this safety profile that we need to discuss with our patients when we're consenting them so that they know what they're letting themselves into. Reassuringly, the longer you're on immunotherapy for, the lower frequency those adverse events have. And so this data here in the first year of treatment, you can see that there are relatively significant events that happen, particularly at the start. But then things tail off and actually become relatively low level later on in year two and subsequently. But of course, we have to pull all this data together. It's all very well saying, yes, it works. And it's all very well saying, yes, we can do it safely. But actually, is it cost effective? Is it something that we should be offering our patients? And in the UK, we've got NICE, a similar um, not quite as important organisation in the USA, it's called ICER. And ICER did a review published in mid-2019 where they found actually avoiding peanut is far more cost effective, but they felt that was probably because of the cost of the treatment. And then lots of people wrote in to go, no, they've got it all wrong, they're make, you know, they didn't do this right, they didn't do that right. And then of course, the treatments got approved, so first in the USA and then subsequently in Europe and the UK. And just before Christmas last year, the NHS, or rather NHS England, announced that 
PAL 40 would become available in the NHS. And then in February, NICE gave their formal opinion to say that it can be cost effective. So why this ambiguity? Why this discrepancy between ICR and then NICE and, and so on? Well, we've got various issues here. The first is there's a lack of longer term data on, well, great, you desensitize them in six to 12 months. But what happens next? Do they keep going with their dose of peanut that they hate the taste of? And actually, what does it allow them to do? How many continue three or four years after the event if they're still eating something that they don't like the taste of every single day? How much dietary liberalisation can we actually achieve? Are we just saying, well, actually, yeah, you can eat things that say may contain peanut now? Or rather, can we say you just don't have to write about anything? Is that the stage that we get to? There are no good data on longer term cost effectiveness and impact on quality of life. And there's a big argument happening at the moment within the community that do we need standardised products such as Palforsia, which costs about £10 a day in, in the UK? Or actually, can we just tell people, well, you know, go, you know, you're all right now, you can eat half a peanut, so just have half a peanut, you don't need to pay £10 for your treatment. Um, so can we use standardised protocols rather than standardised products? Can we try and personalise desensitisation protocols to make things better and safer? Safer. So for the 20% who struggle to be desensitised with lots and lots of adverse events, can we change how we do the treatment to improve their outcomes? Most of the data we have, and indeed the Palforsi approval in the UK relates to children. Can we do it in adults? There are a lot of food allergic people over the age of 18 out there. What's the optimal age to start immunotherapy? There are some emerging data that if we intervene earlier, when people are two, three or four years of age, we might have better outcomes, both in success, but also be able to tackle taste aversion better so that they don't hate the thing that they're used to be allergic to. But there's still nowhere near enough data to understand that. And some of us are concerned that many of these children will outgrow their food allergy normally. And so perhaps by intervening and pushing them, we might actually ruin that and they'll end up still allergic, just mildly allergic, as opposed to with complete resolution. How do we handle patients who are treated? What do schools do? And I've now got 100, 200 kids who are in school or university. Can they? eat peanuts? Can they have some dairy foods? How do you communicate that to people who haven't been through the treatment program? And at some stage, do we turn around and say, you know what, you no longer need to carry injectable adrenaline pens with you. So we need a bit of perspective here. We know that immunotherapy is not new. It was first done in 1908 in a young person with egg allergy. We also know that in actual fact, the risk of anaphylaxis is much likely to be higher than reported because a lot of studies don't actually report accurately the rates of anaphylaxis. They choose to describe wheezing and so on. And so, for instance, in one study, the STOP2 study, wheeze after dosing occurred in one fifth of patients. But so that was 22% of 49 patients. But in the systematic reviews, they've only written one person having anaphylaxis. So there's a lack of consistency in how we report these adverse events and indeed efficacy outcomes. And we haven't got the longer term data for quality of life. But there's clearly something weird going on because despite all the safety concerns and the higher rate of anaphylaxis, we've got this paradox that I've got hundreds of patients on my waiting list to undergo immunotherapy. And even when you tell them about the risks and the side effects, this is something that our patients and our families often want. So there's clearly some sort of paradox here that we need to dig down deeper. And I think it's this. If we look at CBT, when people get anxious, it's because they think something bad is going to happen and the bad thing's going to be really bad and they can't cope. And that holds true for food allergy as well. And so their perception is that every reaction is going to be a bad reaction. And also they think it's likely that they're going to have that bad reaction and they think they can't cope with it. But when they then go through the immunotherapy program and they've had reactions, including a controlled food reaction at the start of the program, 
and they suddenly realize that actually it's not so bad and they can control it and they can inject themselves with adrenaline and then they, they get better and they don't need to rely on someone else to look after them. These rescue factors increase and their anxiety drops to the extent that essentially in OIT, we're not so much desensitizing the body, we're desensitizing the psychology here. And we've shown that one third of the improvement that people report when they have immunotherapy is actually due to just having a safe and controlled reaction at the start of the treatment where we support them when they're having a reaction and we show them how to self-manage. And so maybe that would be a more, far more cost-effective intervention at a population level than treatment. And so we need to think about, well, actually, what are we trying to do here? Is it trying to reduce the risk a little bit? We've already discussed it's probably not these two middle ones. We're not curing people here. Or actually, is it just about dealing with the anxiety, improving their quality of life? And actually, there are other ways we can achieve that. So can immunotherapy become a routine treatment? Well, it involves increased risk for allergic reactions, but our patients seem to want that. They don't care about that so much. The problem we have is that these reactions, especially the severe ones, are largely unpredictable. And I've got patients who are year three, year four of treatment, and every so often they have anaphylaxis when they're not expecting it. It's generally easy managed anaphylaxis, but it catches them and they need to be aware of that. Gut symptoms are common during treatment and that's the main cause of people dropping out. And as yet, we don't have any good treatments for that. And it's easy to desensitize people who aren't so allergic. But what about the patients who have a history of lots of lots of anaphylaxis reactions, sometimes needing two, three, even more doses of adrenaline to manage? They don't do very well on immunotherapy. And so how can we look after them best? Because they're the ones who arguably are more difficult, difficult to treat, but the ones who have most to gain. And this is something that Marta has shown in some wonderful work when she was doing her research back in Spain, that teenagers particularly are at risk here and they need really long term good commitment and supervision and getting that balance right because you don't, can't tell teenagers what to do. You have to work with them in a team to get them to, to comply with treatment. And there are dangers. We've now had one report of death in Canada due to oral immunotherapy, although there are some other factors involved that were probably highly relevant here. And so it's really important that we take the shared decision uh, model when we're discussing with patients. So we have the right information, the correct information. We don't try and put a spin on it so that we can talk to our patients about the risks and the benefits so that their expectations are set, they don't think it's going to be a cure, they understand they're going to need to take their doses every single day for years so that we can make sure we're doing the right treatments for them. And so this is where we're now at. Yes, we've got primary prevention. We can reduce the number of people who end up with food allergy. We can diagnose them properly because diagnostics and food allergy, that's a whole separate topic, but we're certainly not there yet in terms of having good diagnostics. And then we've got a majority, 50, 60, 70 percent of kids with peanut allergy and so on, where actually it's quite easy to desensitize them. But what about the ones who really have the big problem with food allergy, the severe reactions or those where there's a severe impact on their quality of life? Those are the ones where current intervention or immunotherapy isn't so effective. And that's where the focus needs to be. So I'm going to stop there and delighted to take your questions. Thanks so much, Paul, for this great overview. That's that's really nice to, to hear all this all this pro con and what motivates families to to sign up for immunotherapy. So there's a question in the chat. I think it's about one one study that you've been involved in. So I'm sorry you will be happy to comment. So um, the question is, what do you think of the mathematical modeling studies saying that if the allergic person can tolerate 30 milligram of protein, they're safe from cross reaction? and 300 milligrams same from accidental exposure. Do you want to comment on that? I'm going to say it's a complete load of baloney and rubbish. Um, so, so one thing that slipped in with Palforza is this idea of Palforza can make you bite proof. Now, I would say that a bite of a chocolate bar that may contain peanuts is very different from a bite of a Reese's peanut butter cup, which contains a lot of peanuts. And so, you know, what do we mean by bite proof here? It depends on what you're eating. It depends if your curry is made with peanut 
flower that the restaurant owner hasn't told you about and has gone to jail because he killed someone with it. And that's happened a few years ago in Birmingham. Or whether we're talking about a curry where there's made in a place where there's no peanut full stop because they know what they're doing, but actually there are other nuts around and maybe sometimes the other nuts can have low grade contamination. I think it's very hard in isolation to say this amount gives you protection. Um, my own view is that at the end of the day, if you're able to eat four peanuts, so around a thousand milligrams of peanut protein, you're pretty unlikely to get unstuck. It's quite hard to accidentally eat four peanuts. If you happen to go to a dodgy curry house, if you still get that aura itch, and most of our patients when they're treated still do get that, you'd be tempted not to have any more. And even if you did swallow a mouthful or two, three or four, you might have anaphylaxis, but you'll be extremely unlikely to have a severe anaphylaxis reaction. That's my gut feeling, and I know others feel likewise. But it's an area that we're still working on a lot to sort of go, what, what should we be aiming for? What level actually provides a safe amount? And as I said, when we do desensitization, I don't think it's so much we're desensitizing the biology here. I think we're desensitizing the psychology of people's anxiety and fear, which is very well placed until, you know, they get a sense of actually them being in more control and that they can tolerate these foods with low level contamination without any problem. Great, Paul. There's so much support and so much education going going on in, in food immunotherapy. Absolutely. Quite a few questions coming in, so we might stay for another five minutes um, if, if you're OK with that, Paul. So quite a few questions. So the first one is, um, I think, a mum asking or a, or a dad, uh, where, what were the other factors involved in this Canadian OIT death? I have a child doing oral immunotherapy myself. OK, so. First of all, um, peanut immunotherapy, I think, is very different from immunotherapy to cow's milk and some other allergens. Um, people with cow's milk allergy, particularly if they're teenagers, have a different, more severe type of milk allergy than is typical for peanut allergy or younger kids with milk allergy. And, and, and we've seen that over the last few years in a study that we've been working on. Um, so in this case, it was a milk allergic child. Um, there were commu diff communication difficulties from what we can understand and glean between the clinician who was driving the process. It was a very slow process, which some of us think can be risky. Um, you know, to do immunotherapy over years as opposed to over a period of months risks actually making allergy worse. There's some soft evidence for that um, and that's certainly a concern in this case. I guess the other issue that concerns me about this case is that the reaction was to milk present in the cake. And when milk is in a bit what we call a bait matrix, that's in a cake or a biscuit, it gets absorbed more slowly into the system. At the same time, this person was having like a couple of crumbs. It was like a small amount of cake. It was a very poorly defined amount. Plus, it was a cake made from outside. It wasn't homemade. So we don't really know how much milk was in it. And was there an accident? Or did that particular cake have to have more milk than should have been there? Um, so there are a lot of mitigating factors. If immunotherapy is done according to standardized protocols, with lots of safety netting in, in place, I am convinced it can be done safely. And so for instance, where we do it here at Imperial, we've got 24 seven support helpline, we've got strict protocols in place, they go to strict training, and we will take people off studies if we have safety concerns. Unfortunately, I'm not sure others, particularly outside the UK, are necessarily doing things to that similarly high standard. And I think the problem is that we've had at least one death now, I'm sure it won't be the last. We have to do everything we can in our power to make sure that those people who are dabbling in this are doing it safely and doing it according to standardised protocols. Very clear message, Paul. Thank you. Lots of questions we have. Um, next one, very, very important question. Should every child be offered the option of trying oral immunotherapy? And my question to that is, do we have the resources um, to offer that safely? So there's a big fight going on at the moment within the NHS because NICE and NHS England have decided we should be desensitising 600 children with peanut allergy. 
but no one in NICE and no one in NHS England has worked out how this is going to be funded and resourced. So the cost of the palforsia is funded through the NHS, but the cost of all the hospital visits, that hasn't been discussed yet. And so within the BSACI, um, we are currently working out best advice for hospitals who are interested in starting this on how to consider you know, setting up a service. The real risk here is that we decide, well, we're going to treat 10 patients with parathorsia. That's 100 patients who can no longer have a free challenge. And actually, it's far more important people have a correct diagnosis. And also, as I said, that experience of a free challenge can be life changing. You know, I've got some people who didn't proceed with immunotherapy and the improvement in quality in life that they report is as high as the people who had immunotherapy. So my preference would be let's give everyone a correct diagnosis and let's ideally give everyone a safe challenge experience and that's going to do far more benefit than giving everyone OIT, particularly when it will only be successful in about two thirds of people. Great point. Next question. What's the right age? Uh, is there an age where it's too late? So we don't know that yet. Um, Pathfalls is licensed for people aged 4 to 17, although if you start off in that age group and then grow up, you can carry it on. Um, in countries such as Spain, Israel, even America, um, immunotherapy is being done in all ages. Um, there is a tricky age around sort of university college time because people generally have lives that are perhaps less conducive to the sort of rigour and, and routine that's needed with immunotherapy. And that's something that certainly needs a lot more attention. I don't think it's necessarily ever too late. Uh, the issue is more, is it, are there places able to offer it to older people? Because at the moment in the UK, that isn't the case. Great. Um, another question. So is the new development of eosinophilic esophagitis a risk with oral immunotherapy? So this is something that's about sort of swings and roundabouts. Um, the latest data seems to be around the 1% risk of developing symptoms of eosinophilic esophagitis with immunotherapy. So oral immunotherapy treats what we call IgE mediated food allergy. That's the type of food allergy that can cause anaphylaxis. There are other forms of food allergy. One of those is called eosinophilic esophagitis. It's a bit of a mouthful, so we call it EOE as an abbreviation instead. And it's a different type of food allergy that doesn't cause anaphylaxis, but over time can cause a narrowing of the food pipe, the esophagus that takes food from the mouth to the stomach. And that can be very problematic, slows down eating, um, and worst case scenarios, you, you can end up not being able to swallow food essentially. Now, when that happens with OIT, that's a very different phenomena from when it happens outside the context of IT. And this is why. With OIT, you're in a study or you're being monitored closely and it comes on over a period of time. We're watching for it. There's about one in a hundred chance of it happening. That seems to be the ballpark rate in the latest studies. And if it happens, then we can sort it out. And if we can't sort it out, we stop and everything goes back to normal. That's our experience. That's very different from when we see patients with EOE in the community who've had these symptoms for two or three years. So the inflammation has been there for two to three years. They've got chronic inflammation now, and we don't know what the cause is because there's not one single food that we can go, ah, when we did this, you started getting symptoms. So for me and many of my colleagues, EOE just doesn't bother us in the context of OIT because it's something that worst case scenario we can sort out by stopping and it is reversible because it hasn't had that chronic inflammation induced yet as opposed to EOE outside the context of immunotherapy which is a very tricky and difficult beast. Great Paul, uh, next question, what do you think about offering immunotherapy to multiple foods in children with multiple food allergies? I don't think we're there yet. Um, there's a group at Stanford led by Carrie Nadeau uh, that's had a lot of success in multiple food immunotherapy, usually done with an additional treatment called monoclonal adjuvant treatment. This is where you get injected with a monoclonal antibody which helps dampen down the immune system and it really helps make the safety profile really excellent 
But there, apart from injections, there's a cost involved. And the reason I think they get away with it, because if it's you're not getting any side effects, you can chuck in six allergens at one time. But if you're doing five or six things without the benefit of the monoclonal therapy, you're going to get side effects and you're not going to know which allergen is causing what, which one do you need to stop or which one do you need to change? And so for me personally, and again, this is an I rather than a we, I think doing multiple immunotherapy outside the context of a monoclonal intervention is going to be problematic. That being said, I've got some children now where I've desensitized them one after the other to three or four allergens and actually um, it's gone incredibly well. But I'm not yet comfortable with doing multiple foods at the same time. Whether to do a few nuts together is feasible, I think it might be, but to do sort of egg and milk and wheat and peanut and cashew all together, I think it's going to be problematic and because of the safety issues. Great, Paul. Uh, we have a few more questions, but I think we're just going to take one more and uh, we'll wrap up. So that's, um, do you see children doing, say, peanut immunotherapy start react reacting more to all the foods they might be allergic to? So is there any sort of degree of immune activation? Do the other allergies change at all? No, so there's no evidence that I've seen of either immune activation in terms of increasing risk of reactions to other allergens or less reaction because of cross reactivity. Although I'm sure if you desensitize to cashew, I suspect pistachio reactivity would go down as well. But, you know, the immunotherapy does seem to be allergen specific. I think the other concern that we sometimes have is that, you know, if we desensitize, people are then perhaps less careful about looking at food labels and so on, and they might be more at risk of having accidental reactions to other things. It's not because they're more immune activated, it's just because um, their avoidance sort of level drops. We haven't seen that in our own hands at this time, but I do think it's something um, that we need to monitor closely. Great, thanks so, so much, Paul. So I think we're gonna close here. Thanks so much everybody for uh, attending today and huge thank you to Paul and Sejal and our NHLI colleagues for supporting this event. If you want to know more about our postgraduate uh, programmes, you can go on our website uh, and you can always drop us an email if you, if you have any questions there. We're going to be having an open day uh, on the 5th of April, so that's a nice opportunity to hear a bit more about the programme and um, have a little chat with us about what we can offer. So thanks so much uh, for joining today and, and have a nice evening and apologise for not going through all the questions. There are too many. OK, so thanks a lot.